Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. I'm your host, Aaron Harbor, and today we're in Houston, Texas at IHS Sarah Week. Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. My guest today, all the way from Saudi Arabia, is none other than David Hobbs, the head of research at the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center. David, great to have you on the show. Aaron, thanks for having me, and, and it's okay, you can call it Capsuck. Oh, good, yeah. Well, that's, uh, now, tell me a little bit about the since, since you've defected to the other side. I, well, I, I, I like to think of it as, you know, among the Jedi rather than, than the other side, but uh, the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center, or CAPSAC, was established uh, originally uh, in about 2008, uh, really came into proper being in 2012 when we moved uh, to offices in Riyadh and, and started to build a team. And it was established by the late King uh, to create an independent uh, economics and policy research center uh, in order to look at what were, the, what were the insights that would allow policymakers to improve the welfare of society, not just in the region, but, but globally. Um, and so we, uh, we focus very much on how do you make energy available at the lowest cost possible? How do you extract as much value from the energy that you consume? And how do you actually make policies that ultimately uh, achieve their stated objective? Um, and in order to make sure that we were truly independent, it, we were given an endowment that would fund our activities so that we're not actually on an ongoing basis funded by anybody. Uh, and, and an international uh, board of trustees, uh, three Saudis, three uh, uh, international uh, figures, and then the president of the center, whoever that was from time to time. And so uh, it, it allows us to do independent research on, on the key issues um, on a global basis. But we try to focus on, on where, where you can have the biggest impact. And so we're looking at, the, obviously, the, the Gulf, the GCC area, um, very fast area of energy demand growth, uh, amazing demographics in terms of, of population growth. India, China, um, and then we're doing some work in East Africa where they've had big resource discoveries and, and how do uh, the developments of those resources uh, feed through into, into the general economy. In terms of serving, we have so many people uh, around the globe, uh, over a billion, who don't have access to, to energy, certainly not electricity. Yeah. Uh, what, what, are some of, what are some of those challenges we're also going to be adding, and we're in the process of adding a couple billion more? What, what's the, the center's take on? How do you serve those people? So, I mean, I think, I think the first thing you do is you strip away the ideology. There's no right way or wrong way to get energy to people to lift them out of poverty, because there's no doubt energy consumption and, and improving welfare are completely related to each other. Um, and uh, also the energy needs that these people have means that their impact on the global um, environment is actually not very large. So, so there's no doubt you want to increase access to energy um, and, and develop them to a point at which then they can afford to start making decisions um, about the environmental footprint of their energy that, that are aligned with, with what we, we might think is the right thing. But I think, I think you know, the world's got a moral obligation to make sure that people have access to reliable energy. So how do we do that? And how, I, I mean, for example, in Africa, huge challenges in terms of lack of infrastructure, uh, demand, and, and as you said, I mean, it's, it's energy that allows people to pursue paths in terms of education or commerce. Well, I think, I think one of the ways to think about it is that there's no single answer that's right. Uh, I mean, I know it's not going to come as a surprise to you, but Africa's not a country. Um, the, uh, and so there's a lot of diversity uh, of, of economic circumstances, of geography, of, of how populations are spread. You know, in a lot of places, the fallback option is diesel generation running a few hours a day when they need it, um, if they have any kind of formal energy. And, and uh, you know, remote solar energy can be absolutely cost competitive um, with with that kind of system it's very hard you know for for renewable resources in some parts of the world to compete with uh, large utility scale coal that's grid connected and so you've got to you've got to match the uh, the supply to its need and and to gradually build an energy eco ecosystem that serves the community well but whatever you do you've got to find the thing that starts starts the growth um, one of the things, and it's particularly true of gas, incidentally, natural gas, 
you know, often you look at a market and you say, oh, there's hardly any demand for natural gas there. But as soon as you make natural gas available, then you start seeing, you know, demand you didn't even know existed starts appearing. So you don't just displace what might have been informal, you know, uh, biomass for cooking or uh, diesel-powered uh, electric generation or whatever it may have been. You start actually to create industries that are attracted by low-cost fuel, uh, attracted by its availability and reliability. And so you, you actually, you could see a situation in which, it, I mean, if we get, we might get stuck on East Africa if we're not careful, but you could, you could see a situation in which um, developing the, the newly discovered indigenous resources has a leveraging effect that starts to create accelerated economic growth if they have the right policies in place. So, I mean, our interest in the region is, is really trying to work out what are the mistakes that have been made elsewhere that they can avoid? What are the things they can do that, that no one even thought of before that would lead to a, an acceleration of economic development and, and therefore of, of welfare in the region and, and a, a leveraging of the opportunity they have with the resources that they've discovered? All right, in, in that vein, give me an example of uh, mistakes that they can avoid, uh, of mistakes others have made that if someone in a particular country avoids, and, and kind of in the concept of leapfrogging, how do you get uh, communities to, uh, instead of follow the same path, for example, other countries have to, to leapfrog? Yeah, so, so one of the issues is, is setting the right expectations. You know what, if, if you're producing a million barrels a day, it makes a huge difference whether you have a population of 500,000 or 50 million. Um, the expectations of the resource discoveries in East Africa, initially, you know, the euphoria, our problems are solved, there's going to be enough money, uh, you know, I, there's no one thinking this, but, you know, the choice is between red Ferraris and yellow Ferraris. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm overstating, but the truth is a realization that the, the discoveries in Uganda, for example, net out during the plateau of production at a higher oil price than we have today at some 50 to 60 dollars per capita. You, you can't, per year, yeah? you can't live, you know, the, the, uh, the developed world dream on 50 or 60 dollars a year. So, so you've got to be smarter about how you deploy the resources. So the, the, one of the mistakes a lot of people have made is they have assumed that they don't have to keep working in other areas um, of, of their economy because the natural resources will provide that buffer. That, that's mistake number one you can avoid. The second one is to realize that the uh, capacity of the economy to develop requires productivity and skills and, and human resources that, that allow you to, to leverage the, the funds being provided. Um, and so focusing on, on developing human capital. But then you think about you know, what are their immediate needs? It's, it's hard to start planning for 10 years future economic growth when you've got you know, kids not going to school, you've got healthcare problems, you've got access to water. So there's, you know, you've got to deal with some of the basics. Um, and then you've discovered that, that the money isn't going to go as far as you thought. So you, you know, you're into prioritization. The mistakes others have made is maybe not thinking through in a strategic way. And, and actually, it's one of the areas that, that uh, the last couple of US administrations have really focused more on, on Africa and what Africa needs in encouraging the development of power, or in, in the case of, of George W. Bush, focusing on AIDS and, and healthcare in, in Africa. There's a real focus on helping them to do the basic things right to provide a platform for growth rather than trying to uh, set a path, you know, set, set a direction for growth that, that isn't um, necessarily one they're ready for. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with David Hobbs of Capsark. There's more of the Aaron Harbour Show after this. More specifically, right now we look at greenhouse gas emissions in the boundary of the country in which they're generated. And we don't think about the embodied greenhouse gas emissions in the traded goods and services. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. Join me and watch the Aaron Harbor Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show and keep hope alive. 
The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at www.harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. I'm with David Hobbs. David, uh, if you could change one policy uh, across the planet, as it were, uh, what would it be and what impact would it have? I would probably look to make sure that we thought about climate change and carbon regulation, carbon pricing in a slightly different way than we do right now. How what would I mean that? by what that? Would the, because yeah, that was a good general statement. <laughs> um, the, no, more specifically, right now we look at greenhouse gas emissions in the boundary of the country in which they're generated. And we don't think about the embodied greenhouse gas emissions in the traded goods and services. Let me give you an example. If I take a, a, a high energy intensive factory from Texas to Mexico and it continues to putting out exactly the same uh, emissions, um, U.S. carbon intensity has just improved and Mexican carbon intensity has just got worse, probably the output of that factory is still coming back to America, so nothing changed as far as the world's concerned, you just reallocated between the two. Um, if on the other hand you were to set targets in America for carbon intensity that accounted for the embodied emissions, now how do you do that in practice? You might think about some kind of border tariff adjustment that, you know, I'm going to charge a carbon price on everything, whether it's produced domestically or imported, and that way I can get away from the argument that American industry has, why should I impose a carbon price and make myself less competitive than the people from whom we import? So it levels the playing field, it allows us to start targeting in the end the consumption decisions that, that we make, whether in America or anywhere else, um, and I, it would completely change the discussion because it, the danger is that, that you start offshoring and outsourcing emissions. You know, it, I can't remember who was, who was the uh, American legislator who said, you know, it's a little bit like a, a fat guy asking a thin guy to diet on his behalf <laughs> using carbon offsets. Um, you know, it, and and it, it would overcome that whole problem if we, if we were to just change that one thing and come up with a global mechanism of carbon governance or climate change right. governance that, that recognized that trade is an important part of the global economy and, and that we've got, uh, we, we can only deal with a global problem by, by accounting for it in a, in a global way. Would, wouldn't a global carbon tax solve that yeah. problem? Yeah. yeah, but it's quite hard to impose an extraterritorial policy on other countries. Um, whereas, actually, if you decide to go with some kind of border tariff adjustment, you you don't have to impose it on any other country, you're imposing it on yourself, but in a non-discriminatory way. And that has uh, interesting consequences, because if I am selling to America and I know that my goods are going to be taxed on the basis of their carbon, but in common with most taxations or, or tariffs, I can offset whatever tax I charged at source against the eventual uh, tariff, then, then you get quite an interesting outcome in terms of um, retaliation is a good thing. If someone says, you've imposed the tariff, so I'm going to impose the tariff at my end in order to stop you from collecting a tariff on, on my emissions. Now, if we can get a game where the large trading blocks, you know, you only need really the US or North America and Europe, and that's enough of global trade that probably others ha now have an interest in starting to impose. The, uh, now, that's how you might get a global um, carbon tariff even though you never imposed it extraterritorially and tried to negotiate a, a global agreement, um, it happened organically. A little bit like what happened in Paris, you know, we moved from thinking of a top-down system of governance, uh, which, which felt to a lot of, of the emerging economies like it was being imposed on them, to a bottom-up, um, organic, everyone comes up with their plan and, and we work from the bottom up and you know, we meet in another five years and, and we, we take stock and we look at could we do better and we, we apply moral pressure to each other but not, not by imposing on each other but by, by getting people to, to step up. I think, I think that was a tremendously positive uh, development and, and the idea of some kind of border ca uh, tariff adjustment would be philosophically very similar to getting people to, to make, their own, uh, make their own commitments. Speaking of Paris, I've heard so many conflicting opinions about what came out of Paris and what didn't come out. Uh, in, in your opinion, uh, on the positive side, what, what were you most impressed with? Um, I think it, it 
represented the first time that there was as deep an enrollment in a process going forward. It, look, if you add up all of the individual uh, INDCs, you don't get to the level you need to get to. But for the first time, you've got everyone engaged in, in moving towards it, and you've set a baseline from which you can move. Um, and so I, th I think that I, I don't know who was responsible for, for the philosophical flip, um, but it, it stopped it. Um, you know, past conferences have, have stumbled on this issue of them against us, whereas this was one where everyone was pushing from the same direction, some pushing harder than others, but you know, in the end, uh, you know, if you're all pushing in the same direction, you're more likely to get out of the mud. What didn't happen that you think should have happened? Um, it's easy to underestimate how difficult it is to create a political consensus. And so I don't think there's anything that didn't happen that I wish had in the sense that, that maybe I'm, uh, uh, I'm a pragmatist about the speed at which you can get these things to change. And so there, there, are, there are certainly some people out there who are saying, you know, what didn't happen, we didn't get a, 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 an immediate worldwide moratorium on carbon dioxide emissions. Well, you know, Realistically, that was never going to happen. Similarly, you know, there are some people who, who will say, uh, you know, we've, we've damaged the uh, welfare of, of the poor of the world because we've started to impose um, you know, carbon restrictions. And, and you know, that, again, wasn't a valid position. The, I think what Paris achieved, and, and so that's why I'm not disappointed, is it, it gave more voice to the moderate middle than, than maybe we've ever seen before. And, and you didn't have as much of the extremism um, uh, you know, that, that have characterized some of the previous uh, COPs. How do we help, uh, in, a, in a significant way, uh, the developing and the less developed nations? Um, in, in, the, in the same way that we should have been helping them all along, which is uh, to recognize that no economy came from relative poverty to, to relative wealth on the back of handouts. It came from being engaged in the global trade, in the global discourse, in, in, in being seen as, as a peer and, and, and actually you know, investing in itself. Um, I, think, I think sometimes when one creates dependencies, we actually hold them down. Um, and so I think that that's, uh, how do we help? We help by providing them with access to capital, by providing them with access to markets and giving them the opportunity to uh, uh, to develop. Um, now, there's no obligation on, on a developing economy to make the right decisions, but in the end, you know, they live with the decisions they make and, and an increasing number of them are, are functioning democracies in, in uh, you know, different points on, on spectrums, but nonetheless, their objectives are, are, are very similar. All right, five years, the next meeting, what, what's your projection? Where will we be? Well, is it, it, is there a law that says you can only make progress every fifth meeting? Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, well, I, they, I, they haven't made all that much progress in every fifth meeting, but they're meeting every five years. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, there are meetings um, right. in between, going, but, right. but yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think that, the, oh, sorry, you mean under the INDCs? Sorry, yes. I thought you meant the cops, and I was thinking, <laughs> the, uh, how am I going to break this to them? Um, the, uh, no, so, so when they next get together with their plans, I think that we're going to be surprised to find um, a couple of things. One is uh, technology has moved on, costs of uh, lower, uh, uh, lower carbon intensity systems. Um, but also I think you know, there's, there's an interesting question. You know, you've heard probably this week a lot of people talking about uh, the inevitability of natural gas taking a much bigger role in the, in the global energy mix. And I worry that it's not inevitable. Um, that, that there seems to be an equation um, when we've talked to a lot of people uh, in some of the workshops we do, we, we find that the equation coal plus renewables is better than natural gas um, seems to be a winning equation because coal is much cheaper in those places that don't have a high cost on, on carbon implicitly or explicitly and renewables are clearly a long-term um, goal and, and supported by policy. Um, and so natural gas gets caught between you know, the policy aspiration of renewables and the, and the cost competitiveness of coal, and the growth isn't really happening to the extent that, that most people are assuming, and it's certainly not consistent with some of the long-term outlooks you see from, from the IEA and others. The growth in? In natural gas. 
as a, as a proportion of the energy mix. Natural gas doesn't seem to be set on that path that is the inevitable, hey, it's the fuel of the future. Um, so I think we, what we'll see in five years' time will probably be that, that the cost of natural gas will be lower than most people expected it to be, which is what it's going to take for it to secure its share of the energy mix. And natural gas and renewables together will lead to a probably a faster decline in, in greenhouse gas emissions than most people assumed would happen. Uh, but the inevitable pace of, of innovation is, is what we all, you know, we we, uh, we misunderestimate. Um, it is uh, it, it, you know we we forget uh, the human mind isn't very good at handling compounding, um, and and so exponential uh, change is something that we we struggle with. So I, I think five years time we're going to have a very different view of the possibilities of technology, of the cost of technology, of the the fuel mix that we need to choose to to meet the objective and, and we will find that we're in a much better place to to build on the achievements of paris five years from now than than probably the the naysayers expect all right well very optimistic if you ask me i'm an optimistic person but then i'm also a patriots fan and and uh, you know we've learned to be optimistic yeah well we've taught you that but uh, that's another that's another show all right we're going to be right back in our final segment mm -hmm. with david there's more of the Aaron Harbour Show after this. See, I'm, I'm not running for president, so I can say that, that corn-based ethanol is not a good thing um, and it won't affect my chances of becoming the president of the United States. <laughs> the, uh, Neither will your birth. I, that's just a you know, historical disagreement. 240 years should be long enough to get over it, Aaron. <laughs> your opinions, ideas, suggestions and criticisms related to guests, topics, questions or the host are welcome. Please send an email to producer at harbortv.com. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. It's tough for me to limit myself to 140 characters, but you can see how well I do by following the show on Twitter. Follow me at at sign Aaron Harbour. To obtain a DVD copy of this program, please contact info at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. I'm with David Hobbs, the head of research at CAPSARC in Saudi Arabia. So, David, let's talk about the energy transition and, and yeah. what is happening and, and, and what do you see happening. Let's take a look in the next at least 10 years. So, I mean, the first thing to talk about is what do we mean by transition? Um, you know, if you told people that we consume more biomass than in human history, we consume more coal than in human history, we consume more oil and more gas than, than at any time previously, the transitions that we've had apparently away from these things have really not been away from. They've been augmentations because energy demand generally has been growing and we've migrated some of these fuels to their higher value niches from which they're even harder to displace. So, so we haven't had the kind of energy transition that's now envisaged, which is a substitution. You know, we need to... As opposed uh, to an augmentation. Yes, exactly. So, so we've added new sources of energy to what we had before, and those things we had before have grown at the same time, right. maybe slower than they would have done if we hadn't added something, but, but nonetheless right. they've grown. And, and, and when you say biomass, that includes people cutting down trees and burning wood. Wood, yeah. I mean, amongst other things, but you know, corn and, and other things, you know, I'm, I'm not running for president, so I can say that, that corn-based ethanol is not a good thing um, and it won't affect my chances of becoming the president of the United States. <laughs> the, uh, Neither will your birth. I, that's just a you know, historical disagreement. 240 years should be long enough to get over it, Aaron. <laughs> the, um, but the, uh, the end result is that uh, we're, we're trying, unless we can deal with the emissions on the backside, we need to reduce the emissions on the input side. You know, that means reducing how much fossil fuel we, we burn. So if you think about a supply cost curve, uh, you know, I'm, I'm right now uh, you know, high up on the supply cost curve, but I could, uh, if, if I replace that, imagine if world oil demand was 50 million barrels a day. You know, we'd be talking about the glory days when WTI was thirty dollars right. a barrel. Right, you and you're talking. You're, in other words, demand would be ha almost half of what. If, it is if, if we have demand, which is probably in the end where we need to get to in order to uh, uh, to meet a four fifty parts per million uh, scenario, then uh, there's no doubt we'd be a long way down the cost curve. We wouldn't, you know, and, and that would result. Second thing is that cost just, curve just from a pure supply and demand perspective. Yeah, exactly. If, given the supply available. 
cut demand in half, price is going to drop like a rock. And Well, in the short run, for sure. And in the long run, I don't need to go to some of those more expensive resources that, that have a high marginal cost that, that support higher oil prices. Secondly, those people who are on the wrong side of the cost curve, they're not going to sit there and say, well, that's it. They're going to, to compete to get back into the cost curve. So the whole cost curve is going to come down. So I think one of the, the issues that policymakers need to be thinking about is, is renewables, they, they, they see the cost of solar coming down, you know, what we were told this morning, 16% per year for the last 15 years. They forget that there's a lot of cost reduction in the, the incumbent fuels both in terms of reducing the rents that are available, um, you know, because right now, why do we have royalties on oil and gas production? Because there's rent that can be captured. If we if we remove that rent, then the cost curve comes down. Secondly, um, you know, the we get innovation. You've got to compete against the incumbent of the future, not the incumbent of today. If we're going to compare apples to apples, now what does that mean? It means it takes much longer to achieve a transition and it costs implicitly much more because I have to subsidize the, the new entrant for longer and at, at a higher cost. Now that's not a bad thing because in the end anything that's driving down the long-term cost of the energy system we're going to rely on in, in the decades to come is a good thing but if you, if you don't square, you know, level with people and tell them this is what it's going to cost you can end up in a situation as has happened in some European countries where populations said you know these incentives are too much, we're going to stop. And you saw wind and solar development in Spain or in Italy. In the UK, we, we stopped um, incentive schemes and, and killed development stone dead because the incentives lost their popular legitimacy because they ended up costing more than policymakers told them it would. And trust is really important. You know, if, if you're going to carry a population over a decades-long transition journey rather than just a within the life of this current government transition journey, You've got to build the, you know, that trust equity that, that allows you to carry it through. So how do we do a better job of transparency with that type of public well, policy? It, well, I, you know, there's, there's an interesting change happening in some parts of the world. We used to think that tax credits to, to support the capital investment were a good thing or feed-in tariffs to provide a, you know, a, a guaranteed price for the, uh, for the investor. Both of those had the effect of, of probably providing higher returns to the investors than, than, the, pop, than, than the public either realized or when they did realize thought was reasonable. What we're seeing now, um, and actually uh, South Africa is a good example where recently they've, they've put it out to tender. They've said, look, you tell us you know, there's only one number I really need. It's what's the tariff for the power that you generate that I need to pay you for you to, to develop the project. And we'll take competitive bids not by using daily clearing or hourly clearing or half hourly clearing competitive markets, the competitiveness of the market will be in the bids you make to develop the capacity. And what they found is that the tariffs that people wanted to, to when they made a bid, and I think the, the city of Austin achieved some very interesting results in a similar way, much lower than policymakers would have been brave enough to set if they'd been setting a feed-in tariff. So I think that, that we're starting to see a, a mindset shift that says the costs are coming down and we should let the market decide what the right tariff is to support renewable development rather than us trying to guess what it should be, trying to set it in policy and, and hope that we haven't overcompensated people. All right, last quick question. We only have 30 seconds left. Energy conservation. Why don't we see a greater effort, uh, especially well, given its potential benefits? It takes more than 30 seconds, but I'm going to tell you, energy conservation or energy efficiency is the wrong way to think about it. It's energy productivity. How much welfare do I get out of every unit of energy that I consume? It doesn't matter whether your consumption goes up or down as long as you're getting more value out of it. If energy efficiency is about reducing energy consumption, then it fails most parts of the world because energy demand keeps rising because we keep thinking of cool new things to do with energy because energy is one of the things that makes our lives more comfortable. All right. Well, that'll get us thinking for the rest of the day. David, thanks, thanks so much. Great to see you, Aaron. David Hobbs, the head of research for CAPSARC. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching. Please contact us. We want to hear from you. 
and thanks for watching.